The metaverse is emerging as the next big technology platform and promises to be the next frontier for human experiences on the internet. Into the Metaverse covers companies, technologies, and trends that are bringing these promises to life. Join creator and host Jonathan Ross Friedman, founder and CEO of SuperSocial, as he interviews the brilliant minds that are building, shaping, and investing in the Metaverse. Welcome to Into the Metaverse, where we help make sense of the Metaverse through deep interviews with the brilliant minds who build, create for, and invest in the Metaverse. I'm Jan, and joining me today is my friend and fellow thinker, Jusse van Drunen, who teaches the business of video games at NYU Stern School of Business and also wrote an excellent book called One Up, Creativity, Competition, and the Global Business of Video Games. Jusse spent the last two decades as an industry analyst working with all of the major firms in gaming on strategy. And after selling Super Data Research, a game research firm he co-founded to Nielsen in 2018, He's now investing and advising data companies and game makers and also have a fantastic podcast, which is called Unboxing, which covers the business of gaming. So go check out the podcast. Just really great to have you on the show again. Thanks. Thanks, man. I always enjoy our conversation. I appreciate that intro. That was very nice. Thank you. Jan. And as always for our audience, everything discussed on the podcast is not a financial advice. Content is strictly educational. So let's dig in. As we continue to build an evolving consensus around what the metaverse is, which actually sounds like has never been a better time to talk about establishing mm -hmm. a consensus because there's ever more opinions with what's going on in gaming. And we see people like Phil Spencer, who runs Xbox at Microsoft, and we see what Meta is doing. And everything is still very much convoluted in between NFTs and crypto and gaming and metaverse. And I think still majority of the world that is part of the conversation, everyone are trying to establish this sort of consensus. So, so starting with the first question, I like to ask everyone on the show, just what do you think the metaverse is right so i guess there's two versions so there's the right now version of the metaverse and then there is the maybe later version of the metaverse the right now version is the metaverse is an idea and it's not just an idea it's a powerful enough idea for all these companies and all this capital to focus their attention and their efforts to move into this next new space let's call it the new internet right whatever you want to call it but it's ostensibly some dream some hope a fantasy that we will be seeing an even better version of internet based social interconnectivity where we don't just hang out on twitter but we also work together and collaborate and there will be bigger faster more opportunities to do a broader range of human interaction and i think that's a very powerful idea and it's the same idea as uh, we've seen previously with for the space race in the 70s, right? It's like, we got to get to the moon first. And that was this, you know, it galvanized and it allows people to sort of see in the same direction and stuff gets done this way, right? So, so I think so often technologies, including the right now metaverse, are these very powerful ideas that allow us to focus and sort of unidirectionally invest and build and create things. The maybe later version of all this in my mind is, well, let's see, right? Because we started off, if you recall, with a lot of other metaphors 10, 20 years ago, we had the information superhighway. That sounds cool. I have no idea. I don't feel like I'm on the highway now, right? That's a metaphor that kind of came and went. Cyberspace was another one. So there's a range of ways that we initially label and try to summarize these initiatives, but five, 10 years later, we've clearly left that behind it. So the right now one I'd like because it focuses people and it opens a discussion as to what we would like it to be and how can we make it better perhaps. The maybe later versions, like we'll see, like that's totally up to us. It is, and I think in many of the conversation I have, and obviously as a builder myself in the space, I am very much in belief that the metaverse is going to be the reflection or the outcome of what people are actually creating every day right mm -hmm. and so i think that's why it's so entertaining in a way where meta platforms capture such a big piece of the conversation i think there's just so much capital involved in that which obviously creates a chatter around meta specifically but at the end of the mm -hmm. day 
whatever the metaverse become and whatever the iterations of the metaverse over the next 10, 15, 20 years, what will be available is what people, companies, creators, developers, designers are actually creating. And are mm -hmm. those creations attract people to spend time, to spend money? Mm -hmm. And a bit of the conundrum, I think, at least at the moment, is that there are very few platforms that are quote unquote metaverse type platforms or that has components mm -hmm. or pillars of identity re resembling the metaverse that where people spend time, right? If it's Fortnite creative, mm -hmm. or if it's Minecraft, if it's Roblox, very few people are on Meta's horizon, right? There's very few people who are there consistently mm -hmm. every day, very few people on other platforms, anywhere from core to, you know, sandbox, essential and et cetera, et cetera. So you, you've been covering the evolution of the games industry for a very long time. I gave a shout out to your excellent book and always with a fine sort of balance between the business side and the creative side. One of the things that you and I spoke one time was the dirty secret that the business of gaming is business. <laughs> of course, there's art mm -hmm. and there's creativity, but at the end of the day, it's a business that almost accidentally is now worth about $300 billion in industry size, market size, a year, right? That's the spend a year. And over the past two years, gaming reached a whole new level of awareness and resonance with consumers and with a wider population, right. obviously also due to COVID and the human behavior shift of being at home for so many hours every day. And so in your mm -hmm. mind, what are the key reasons for the fact that gaming kind of stratosphered its way, its way even to a greater level of awareness globally? in a way that everyone talks about games and gaming and being part of gaming, either if you're a creator, a user, a consumer, a brand, a parent, mm -hmm. a government, and where does mm -hmm. it go from here as a sector? Okay. So I'll start with the historical component, which the easiest way to pinpoint like two moments is of course, broadband penetration, the sort of gradual rollout of fast connections across households in every economy around the world or whatever, most of the economies around the world, developed ones. People go online and they want to have something to do, right? It's, you can only email so much. And I think it creates a space, an online space that we start to fill with activities that come natural to us, right? Whether that's singing or dancing or whether that's playing. I think that people do what people do irrespective of their technological moment. And it starts to manifest in different ways, but so broadband penetration allowed video games to transition, not just to a service model. Initially, it was really about digital downloads, right? You would get the full premium download just delivered to you over the internet. But you start to see a transition in what it means to play MMOs, for instance. So you used to have EverQuest, which was a very popular multiplayer online role-playing game. And it was accessible, it cost a bunch of money, and it's hard to get into socially. World of Warcraft kind of popularized that category of games. That's really what Blizzard did well in about 2004. So that leaned, of course, a lot on broadband penetration rolling out. At the same time, the development and the innovation of new business models and revenue models around it allowed a larger population to participate. So that's one moment you can point to. The second one is, of course, the introduction of the smartphone. And we get it, Angry Birds and all that. But what the smartphone also did was make it incredibly easy for a large body of app developers to participate in that ecosystem. Right? Now we're purely talking about a two-sided or a multi-sided business model. But Apple was very smart by making it only 100 bucks for people to become a developer, a certified developer on their platform. Sure, there's rules, but you can create something and launch it on the app store. That was so different than the more closed platforms of Sony and Microsoft, where you have to go through like years of development and so on. So you see very quick iterations and very aggressive competition on the supply side. We probably know the demand side of it, but the supply side really just created this wealth of content. And then with a little bit of nudging, like eventually Apple allowed free to play monetization and that then allowed it to skyrocket. So intuitively as i mentioned like people will do what people do when you're confronted with these new technologies these new online spaces like a fancy new thousand dollar fifteen hundred dollar phone you instinctively just want to play with it you just want to kind of see what happens here and so 
gaming was the perfect way of doing it, right? Rather than watching music and watching film, which they went through their own transition. The digitalization of those types of entertainment is a little different, mostly because executives there were holding off on it, right? For, for the music industry, digitalization basically just was another way of saying piracy and stealing, right? You wouldn't download a car, right? That message was beaten into an entire generation. The games industry embraced it more because they had a lot of benefits to them. But uh, Valve in particular discovered early on that you could send updates. So your very risky, expensive development project would be less risky because you could send patches down the, down the pipe. And then once they figured it out to do for some of their games, then they opened it up to third parties and now you have Steam, right? So that is, I think those are some of the highlights as to what makes them, what makes gaming so interesting in this context. And then the question as to what's the future look like? The, I'll be brief on that one because that's just speculation ultimately. But I do think that we're going to see a massive transition in technology. What you generally see is a moment of consolidation because it is just better for large companies to buy a bunch of IP, just bulk up and get a little tougher, board up their windows before the new technological wave hits because you don't know what you're going to get, right? So that present, so the transition into the cloud, like it's not entirely clear how that's going to play out for everybody just yet. We see Stadia come and go. What's up with Amazon? Are they really serious? Netflix is buying studios. And so everybody is sort of placing their bets for this next wave of transition to, to come around. And will there be a celestial arcade? I think so. I think that's just a really easy way to do things. And that makes a lot of sense. But will there be 12 platforms offering it? I don't think so. It's too capital intensive. So we're going to see a consolidation of the industry right before the transition to new markets and new technologies. And that then, I think, reconfigures again what it means to play games, to make games, and so on. And I think that the that's a really great breakdown, both kind of the historic perspective and your point of view on the future. And I think if you look at what mm -hmm. could happen from here on, what I'm really curious about, when I look at these virtual worlds that have emerged over the past decade and a half, primarily used by gamers, right? If you talk about game worlds like World of Warcraft, League of Legends, Grand Theft Auto, really virtual world that are now have millions of millions of people who are playing and modding and creating and building guilds and communities. Some of it is gamers, some of it is kids. What I'm curious about is, and I'm not talking about the evolution of mobile gaming, especially casual gaming, which really provided a entry point into games using mm -hmm. mobile phones for a whole new population. But in my mind, a lot of the people who play mobile games have always played games. They just played games right. in a different way, right? Yes. So I think a lot of these new companies that have emerged anywhere from King and others really created this sort of resonance with casual gamers who didn't want to play deep games. But when I think about the metaverse and I think about these deeply immersive, deeply social, deeply expressive virtual worlds that are going, we're going to test our personality through 3D avatars and we're going to do all sorts of things, especially mm -hmm. playing games. Do you believe that what it means to create or use a video game is going to evolve in a way that completely transforms the very nature of what is a video game and put it in a context that sits at the intersection of social media, of video games, of almost like social entertainment in a way that can be relevant for billions of people around the world, not in a form of a casual game, but in a form of deeply being immersed in something? Mm -hmm. Or do you think there's necessarily going to be a natural evolution of games continue to be games? People are still mm -hmm. going to play classic console games, classic mobile games. And then alongside that, there might be a whole new category of mm -hmm. quote unquote interactive entertainment experiences in 3D that may start as a video game, but ultimately can evolve into a whole new category that we can't really conceive at the moment. Yeah, I like that. That's a good question. So the, my answer to that would be this. In music, you see still people playing cassette tapes and vinyl records. In fact, vinyl records had a resurgence over the last few years because of all these hipsters out there playing, trying to impress their dates. But there is 
always a deep sense of emotional connectivity and like emotional experience with how you grow up. What's your preferred entertainment? What are the channels that you're familiar with? It. What are the things that you enjoy? And people will always look for it, right? On top of that also sits the notion that so often do we transition to new technologies by labeling them in reverse. We talk about wireless phones. Why would you have to say that, right? But it's because handhelds and like smartphones, they have a rotary phone image to indicate that's what you're doing. You're making a phone call. Like, so all the way from like our emotional experience to this sort of skew morphic, like the, the way that we visualize these things in our daily use, you see this sort of leaning back on old versions of things, whether that's telephones or vinyl records. Games will go the same way. People still play chess. In fact, things like chess.com are massively successful. You see on Twitch, lots of really cool chess players. The YouTube is just riddled with cool. And these are hour long breakdowns of historic games of current championship. And it's, that's a really old game, right? But it allows to reconfigure itself and to redefine itself in a new environment of new technologies and just find this huge base. So I think to answer your question, games are the type of social interaction that we might have temporary fads and things that are kind of cool, but overall you're starting to see certain characteristics about contemporary gameplay that will probably be classics and universal, provided that we have the technology to keep it going, right? So these massive multiplayer games, that's probably pretty much a given in the future. Like we're, that's what draws people to this. The reimagining of video games into the future then, I don't think that it's going to be this dedicated sit down moment, right? Um, I think mobile gaming gave a first iteration of how it's casual and you can play games standing at the cash register. And that's cool. Watching my nine-year-old play games, it's fascinating to see how, you know, he will have three, four of his friends in our basement all on their iPads. They're talking. It's like a sewing circle down there. They're at the same time. They're also all within, uh, in the same Roblox world together, playing a whole bunch of like, oh, let's go check this out. And then they're exploring it together to sort of just you know, wandering about in this digital space. And they're each watching in this tiny screen in the corner of their iPad, a, like a separate YouTube video. It's like, oh, it's Mr. Beast, check this out. And so the layers of interactivity that these kids at nine years old are comfortable with, and that's intuitive to them, vastly exceeds my own experience where it's like, I would sit there with my little Tetris and my Nintendo. It's like, that was what you were doing. So I think the metaverse is not going to be, to put it in the context of the future and the question of what the metaverse would look like. I don't think that's a singular space that we enter into and then we go do something in there. I think the lines between all of these things are blurring. You're watching some content, you're in a digital environment, but I'm also talking to the people in my physical proximity and making that work from a mental perspective, but also technological perspective. I think that is much more akin of what things look like and games, they facilitate, they provide the music to that melody. I like that. And I think I feel very comfortable deterministically claiming that or supporting mm -hmm. what you're saying, because at the end of the day, metaverse or not, technology is only going to be have a bigger role around us. And, yes. you know, we're going to have touch devices and other gateways into tech, into mm -hmm. applications, into software all around us, right? Today, it's mm -hmm. mostly from the mobile phone, game console, PC, maybe smart TV. Mm -hmm. But once we sit inside an autonomous vehicle, it will have touch devices all over the place in the windows, in the dashboard, you know, Tesla is already incorporating, I think some games into their operating mm -hmm. system, right? So it's going yeah. to continue and be all around us. And I, but I do like the way you framed, there's all of these layers of mm -hmm. content that ultimately together is going to comprise the evolution of the internet, right? And mm -hmm. call it metaverse, we can call it super net, we can call it whatever, but that's mm -hmm. those multiple layers that are coming in. So the video games industry is already an industry of about $300 billion roughly, right? Content and devices <clears throat> yep. dominated by very large companies, right? Of course. What role do you believe that companies like Blizzard, like Take-Two, like EA, right? Historically large, dominant content companies 
plus technology, because they've also been building technology to enable their own games, right? What role mm -hmm. do you believe they play in the future of both the games industry and the this new frontier? And also, how do they fit into the conversation with other upstarts that are not purely, quote unquote, games companies like Roblox, like Epic? So that's a really, that's a really interesting question, right? It's always a matter of, you know, when mobile came around, you could ask the question, like, what's up with Ubisoft and Take-Two and EA and how are they going to deal with all this? Uh, still trying so to figure off. out. <laughs> They're still working on it. But it, part of the reason why initially people were sour on smartphones is because, or mobile gaming as a category, is because EA was dominating the space, which was worth less than a billion before the iPhone. And EA was like, they held like 70% of the space. So everybody's like, yeah, whatever, that's totally consolidated, who cares? And then the smartphone broke it open. But the same question we can ask now is like, what are these incumbent, these legacy publishers going to come up with? And the first answer tends to be, it's a new technology. We are risk averse. We're going to wait and see, which is what they've done historically. And it is probably the right uh, attitude because they stand to lose the most, right? You could raise a bunch of money and throw some games out there and see if it works. That's it. Like it could fail, but that's the end of it. Like you, you're not sitting on a multi-billion dollar franchise that you could erode very quickly if you don't make the right decisions. So I think their initial focus, and you see this when you hear take two talk to saying like, well, GTA already is a metaverse. So they're like, oh, we check the box. Next question, please. Right. So they tend to not really... I mean, they address it, but they're not really acting on it in a meaningful way. They're not doing what Mark Zuckerberg is doing. Say, like, I'm going to take my whole company and just sink it down this hole. It's the absence of apex predators that is often the moment when you see a lot of innovative startups take the cake and they take that initial momentum. The legacy publishers are then, they have two roles. It's one of them is uh, they can start cobbling them up, which is what they've done finally after 10 years, right? They start to really acquire bits and pieces. We see... King Digital getting acquired by Activision. You see Zynga uh, becoming part of uh, the Take-Two empire. Uh, EA made a bunch of pur purchases. And so they just add it on, so, which is in a cynical way saying like they innovate through acquisition. So that's one role that they can do. They sort of just buy their way into that part of the casino. Or they become the content component to a much larger entity, like a platform holder. And I think that, that you have to wonder... When you have this established IP, that's probably the better move because you could spend a bunch of your money on hoping on a bunch of these other projects, but really the thing that makes you is Grand Theft Auto. The thing that makes you is World of Warcraft and so on. So now with Microsoft trying to acquire Activision, I think that is a precursor of what's coming next. I think there is no, it's not a hard transaction for me to imagine that EA is going to be acquired by an Amazon or one of those companies. If Netflix, after all of its recent purchases and studio founding efforts, if they see enough return on investment, they're going to open that budget even further. And so the Ubisoft used to be $12 billion market cap. Now it's like four. So it's not expensive, right? What's up with CD Projekt Red? Like, should they stay in independent? What a boon it would be if Amazon buys them out. Like, what does that look like? Right. So I think that's the, the legacy and incumbent publishers with the big IP they should either innovate through acquisition or they're going to just be acquired. That makes a lot of sense. And I think we're already starting to see that, right, with the acquisition of Microsoft acquiring mm -hmm. Blizzard. And funny you mentioning Netflix, they just acquired their sixth studio. But I like to say it, there's, this is still their MVP, right? They're acquiring mm -hmm. small size studios. Wouldn't be far fetched that in a year or two after they proved the model, Netflix would go after a company like Take Two or Ubisoft or others, because they're obviously ramping up their content portfolio, given that they are a platform. So I have to add, like Netflix, I've been surprised. It's just not, it's just not encourage anybody to buy their shares, but it's to say, like, you know, Netflix, like all the other big tech firms, is sort of out there trying to do this, but they seem to have a more nuanced talent, right? So the acquisition of Spry Fox, they've been around for twelve years. They're really clever people. That know what they're doing. So you go, kind of, okay, qualitatively, they're going about this very differently than, say, what Stadia was doing, which is much more, we get that first and we just buy volume and, oh, now it's not working, right? So I think really the difference between becoming an aggregator and a distributor versus having quality content in your portfolio, I think that, that is a distinction that not everybody's making 
between them, right? And I think Netflix is really skewing towards the latter. I think that they're doing a good job at that. Well, I think also what's different here between Netflix, let's say, and, and Stadia is that Stadia had nothing. It's a completely new platform. They needed to build a brand recognition and reputation for themselves. Of course, the fact that it started and was owned by Google actually only make it more difficult probably because mm -hmm. people have so much lack of <laughs> conviction on new products mm -hmm. built and launched by Google. And I think what's interesting is that Netflix already has the volume. They already have the awareness of being a platform. And so they're in a place of being less pressured potentially in like, mm -hmm. okay, we just need a thousand games to attract the users. It would have been very easy to do that given that they're a massive platform and you could see how, hey, we have the platform. Mm -hmm. Let's just have gazillion games to satisfy it. And that's what they've done with movies. But if we go back, mm -hmm. Netflix started with their originals, TV shows. They also started slowly. They built the first, mm -hmm. built the second, right? House of Cards was basically the proof of concept that set mm -hmm. the stage for everything to come. Then it became 10 new TV shows every week, right? Mm -hmm. You can't even keep track anymore. So I do suspect that assuming they can prove their proof of concept, their MVP, I think they're going to seek for what is that one game that propels the Netflix oh, totally. games awareness, right? What's their house of cards game going to be that then drives that volume? I think that's what I'm Absolutely. expecting to see, which is what is that one game that people are going to be like, oh, I can play great games on Netflix games, right? And yeah, so I think you're right. I think you're right. I think they're going to slowly do that and then eventually just hopefully hit a blockbuster. And then now they establish, that's the moment they establish themselves as a clear destination, as a clear platform competitor in that ecosystem. Until then, they're taking, I guess what they've done historically is like they look at the analytics when they make their content acquisitions too, right? That's part of that model is collecting reams of data on consumer behavior and say, you know what we need? We need a more sci-fi action or we need more anime based on video game adaptations or whatever. It's they figure out the formula as they look through their own data tropes. I think they're doing the same thing with games. They don't have as much data probably, but they're the only other company that could really do that well is like an Amazon. Like the, it's another one of these data hungry firms. So we'll see. I'm excited. I think the entry of non-endemic firms into this space, I think is a really interesting transition. It's a major driver of change, obviously, but it also is part of your earlier question, you know, the popularization of video games and games becoming mainstream. This is it, this is that moment. Now, like it's no longer these six companies over here doing what they do. Suddenly it has the attention of these massive platforms like Microsoft, Apple, these are trillion dollar companies. And now they care about games. And that's that shift in perspective, I think is significant. A hundred percent. And it's only going to become even more important as the modality of a 3D virtual world as a consumer mm -hmm. experience form factor, mm -hmm. let's say, continues to grow. That leads me to switching gears and talk a bit about the next iteration of branded games. So branded games historically has been mostly translations of IP, if it's a TV show, a book, or a movie into a game, into a video game, right? And we are now starting to see, and I'm very close to that frontier, we're starting to see just any brand that wants to create its own dedicated, bespoke virtual world, which is essentially at the moment very much a, a game world on a Let's use what's happening on the, on the Roblox platform where consumer mm -hmm. brands, in our case at Super Social, we've developed NARS Color Quest with NARS Cosmetics, which is a prestige beauty brand. And so what mm -hmm. we're starting to see is a myriad of consumer brands, anywhere from retailers to fashion brands, beauty, and you name it, coming into platforms like Roblox and building you know, branded experiences or branded world that are inspired by the brand, but are really, it's a game. It's a video game mm -hmm. that people need to play. They engage, there is monetization and so on and so forth. What's your POV on that? Do you think, do you see that as a natural evolution of gaming as a category? Do you see that as the incarnation of persistent bespoke virtual world as mm -hmm. the next generation of websites and apps for brands? Is it something that is at the intersection of both of these? 
All right. So I think I have good news and bad news in that. It's uh, the good news is this. All right. So the so because gaming and interactive online spaces have become so popular, especially among younger consumer groups, which is of course by far the most interesting one for advertisers and brands. I think that there is an inevitability around this. But I spent my t the time that I spent at Nielsen, I spent mostly explaining to brands. You need to get on this and not just people making toilet paper, but also sports franchises. It's like, look, you can reach 10 times the number of consumers through video games than you can do through conventional forms of marketing and other channels. And so the good news is that, that as games became this multi-billion consumer audience worldwide, you end up with like, look, you have to be there and go find a spot. And that's exactly what historically advertising has always done, right? They don't really care about the channel. Like they just like, you know, soap series emerged because they figured out like, Hey, we could just a hundred percent sponsor daytime TV shows that the people that will buy our products will watch. And so that's, and that was the origin story of soap series and these sort of daytime TV shows. So I think the same thing will happen to games where you have a category of content and experiences that will be. Uh, invariably sponsored or produced or paid for by particular brands that say, look, we have a place here where we can reach the type of consumers that we need to reach. And it works really well. It's an easy transaction. Now, so that's the good news. I, I really believe that as because games have become a mainstream form of entertainment, that sustainability of an indirect revenue model, AKA advertising now becomes feasible. The bad news in that is that we're not quite there yet. And by that, I really mean, and of course, I would say this as a data guy, but at some point it's important that, you know, you need to move the budget, right? So right now, my guess is when it comes to say the metaverse and brands, but there's a bunch of younger executives that have a bright idea and they want to take a flyer on some idea and they take the bottom 2% of their budget and throw it in the metaverse and see if it works and what can we get out of it, right? But most of the thinking and decision-making is still done by people that are not quite there yet. They haven't fully embraced this. Like I said, that was a big part of my job is explaining to senior executives that this mattered. And they looked at me like I was speaking a different language. And it's, so you have to have the quantifiable backup that shows that if you spend a dollar here versus a dollar there, that the metaverse or interactivity or online experiences give you a bigger yield. And even when you do that, you're still dealing with this mental inertia of an industry that's been spending $70 billion a year on TV advertising, right? It's just not, they're not fully set up for that. And so you start to see it emerge on a brand basis. And I think there's a lot of clever agencies popping up that doing that, that build interesting experiences. But what you're really looking for is of course, like, okay, what are the metrics that can prove the case and make it so that if we're not on these platforms, we're missing out, right? And so is it a nice to have or a need to have? And the distinction between those two is numeric. You need to be able to prove the case numerically. And even then you're still dealing with a set of executives that is slowly relenting, but they are clearly not quite ready for that yet. And while it makes a lot of sense to you and me, I think that there, there is an added value to having things sponsored, just like sports is mostly sponsored. If we wouldn't have it in the way that we have it if it weren't for all the brands that, that finance it. Online and digital experiences will be the same. We see the vision, but I think there's a lot of people that need to be convinced. And once they do, they will transition from like the bottom 2% of their budget to the 80 that gets immediately locked in the second the budget becomes available, right? So the big sponsorships, like they need to transition from whatever they're doing today to these online experiences. That's going to be a much harder conversation. And I think that's what's happening in the next five to 10 years. And we definitely see the early signals of that. And but there's major brands and major budgets that are absolutely have nothing to do with these next generation platforms. And I think there's going to be some sort of a reconciliation that involves leadership changes and the evolution of leadership in these companies that is really pushing mm -hmm. the boundaries, right? I think we're starting to see millennials who are slowly over the coming years will graduate to become more senior leaders mm -hmm. in companies. A lot of them grew up playing games, playing video games, anywhere from Super Mario to World of Warcraft and of starting to really cement the position of 
these next generation social platforms and mm -hmm. the role they play. But it's true that a lot of brands are still trying to figure out, you know, Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat, right? And that's still the new frontier for a lot of brands. Oh um, yeah. TV advertising and it, and it, didn't decline, but it's still a major source of investment for brands. Well, it has established infrastructure, right? And relationships, and we have contracts in place. And so it's like you're just sort of dealing with the unwinding of some of that. I remember, uh, so because I teach a class, I have the whole array of 19 and 20 year olds every week in my classroom. And I remember when Facebook really was in the up and up a few years ago, it's like the answer of a lot of, the answer to the question, what's your social media strategy for major brands was let's hire someone who's 19 years old and they'll figure it out. That's not a plan, right? And so I think you have a lot of these canaries in the coal mine now too, with things like the metaverse you got to get a lot more serious. Like if you start to imagine yourself as a brand, and I, and I think fashion is a really good example. You know, they have like Burberry just announced like a, a cooperation, a collaboration with Minecraft. But it's like you're starting to see these odd cross pollinations that kind of make a lot of sense, but you have to really go a little bit further down the rabbit hole. Like it can't just be like these little test cases. Like it needs to be a much more focused effort. It reminds me so much of the conversation I would have with them. Um, TV executives, right? So you would sit there and explain to them like their cost per user or cost per install or their cost per thousand in a conventional TV setting would be astronomically higher than it would be on a mobile. Targeting was worse. You didn't know if it worked. You couldn't really trace the whole consumer journey. On mobile, you could. You could target people better. It was cheaper and you would really see the direct results of it financially. And they still would not embrace it. It's like, what do you like? Why? And it's because they were like two years away from retirement. They're not going to break anything on the way out. They're trying to play golf this weekend. Right? So I think part of the bad news in that context is that while the prospects have certainly improved with the popularization of games, the work has, it hasn't gone away magically. I think it, it's probably for someone like you much easier to have that conversation nowadays than it was five years ago. And I think you know, having that foresight, I think that speaks to your vision and your initiative at the same time, I think from the trenches that it's still quite a bit of work to kind of build it all out and prove the case and make it all count. I feel like indirect revenue, that's the way how most people uh, pay in, into these entertainment forms, right? I mean, Netflix is doing it now too. They're experimenting with ads. And so as the macroeconomic trends are shifting, we're going to see a proliferation of advertising revenue, brand budgets, moving into these new video streaming, video gaming, uh, and metaverse type experiences. And it's going to be a groundswell. I think if you can prove the case, if you can build it and prove it like numerically, that that's a really strong proposition for some of these companies. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of chatter and buzzwords, obviously around the metaverse, for example, this trend of companies hiring mm -hmm. chief or appointing chief metaverse officer. There was not, mm -hmm. there wasn't chief internet officer. There was no chief Facebook officer. There was no chief social media officer. There's no chief gaming officer. There's no chief TV officer. There, there should not be a chief metaverse officer. I don't think brands that, or companies. I, I like that. I didn't expect that. I, I thought I, you'd be on that. I, I thought you'd be like, no, that those are the people I work with. But you, so you're saying the chief metaverse officer seems like a bit like an empty term or like. I think that it it's not about the role. It's not about the person. I don't think brands or companies need a chief metaverse officer. I think they need a metaverse mindset, mm -hmm. right? They need to incorporate metaverse DNA and really deeply mm -hmm. understanding what that means. I don't think you need a C-suite executive that all they do is metaverse. I think you need a C-suite that can mm -hmm. own what metaverse means for that particular brand or that particular company. And that person probably already has a title, right? Maybe mm -hmm. underneath them, they want to appoint someone who adds the exploration group around metaverse or mm -hmm. VP something. But I think it's very trendy to say, oh, let's appoint a chief metaverse officer. Like appointing a new CXO role is not like, shouldn't be as something as buzzy as a potential evolution of the internet. Just like we right. do, I've never heard a chief internet officer in my life. I don't think <laughs> any company ever had a chief internet officer, chief telephone <laughs> officer, chief TV officer. I don't mm -hmm. think we need to take technology and put it in the context of an executive role. I think there needs to be a clear executive champion and owner of what the metaverse mean for the organization, someone who can run and drive mm -hmm. the work stream of how do we make sure that 
we understand what the metaverse could mean for our organization, for our brand, and can establish and solidify a well-aligned metaverse strategy across the organization coming from understanding what it is, what are the business applications that are relevant for the company and for the brand and mm -hmm. building a capability where that comes into fruition across multiple disciplines. And again, the reason is because I don't think that the metaverse, and that's the challenge and why I do understand why some companies appoint a chief metaverse officer, which is, I don't think of the metaverse as something that is only applicable to marketing in a way or e-commerce mm -hmm. in a way. I think the metaverse is really a fundamental shift in the way the internet is going to look like, and it will have much greater ramifications where you spend advertising dollars, even mm -hmm. though in the near future, that is the more obvious way to think about it. And so to me, it's really about developing, nurturing the mindset of understanding, embracing, experimenting with the metaverse across the organization. And sure, you can appoint a chief metaverse officer, but let me tell you something bluntly. I don't think appointing a chief metaverse officer is going to guarantee anything to any mm. brand or any company. Where the rubber meets the road is going to be the execution, the implementation of the insights. What do you experiment yes. with? What is the vision for mm -hmm. your brand when you put it in the context of what the metaverse is, what it could become? And how do you enable a journey for your organization to mm -hmm. really come in a meaningful way, in an effective way, in a sustainable way? And part of that is what we're exploring when we're talking to brands and partners is really how do we do this sustainably? And what do you actually want to accomplish? My number one question is always, what is your KPI? How are you going yeah. to measure success? And what success looks like for you, what's, for your what's particular the win condition? Brand? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, totally and I think agree. that connects to what you described earlier about the measurement, right? If you can't, I think it's Peter Drucker who said it, right? If you can't measure, you can't manage. So if you don't but, measure it, yeah. how would you know you're successful and we're on the right direction with this exploration? If you can't measure, you can't metaverse. Now, it's true. I feel that there's a lot of these uh, conversations said to be kind of cyclical in that sense, right? I'm reminded that, especially, I guess, the world where you spend some time, it's like luxury brands and these consumer packaged goods, like that type of company, they were asked like 10, 12 years ago, what's your digital, what's your online strategy? And the thing is like what works for Prada is different than what works for, you know, mayonnaise because of the consumer experience and where they want to see your products and what their convenience is and how fast they want it and how exclusive it needs to be and so on. And then you have to consider like, I love and hate Nike's online experience. On the one hand, these are some cool shoes. On the other hand, they're impossible to get sometimes. If I'm not on top of this experience constantly, it's just incredibly fun. And so, but they create this scarcity at the same time that also is part of the hype. And so they manage that really well for themselves. I think when it comes to whatever the future of the internet may be, metaverse or otherwise, you, know, you have to really define from the ground up what it means for a brand how they play, like, you know, to your point, what's the win condition? What's the KPI in this context? But also what makes sense for the experience? Because when I'm buying whatever, a $10,000 coat, which I've never done, but let's say I'm buying a product coat if there's such a thing for me, as opposed to a jar of mayonnaise, that's a very different consumer journey. Like, okay, well, how do you define that? How do you, you communicate that to your customer base? And how do you make it exciting or just meaningless and frictionless so that they could just do it quickly and it comes as part of a subscription. I don't know, but so all of those questions have to be answered. And they, I think, have done so in a sort of web two setting where you have websites, where you see a bunch of stuff and then maybe there's some kind of user acquisition or some kind of referral fee that uh, some influencers will get. But what now if it's in a 3D environment, you know, can I try it on? Like, can I have my body scanned and then have like an accurate replication of myself in there? Is that reasonable? Is that gonna cost me a lot of time or money? I don't know. So you can see how each of these consumer experiences are very different and you have to tailor them. And so a metaverse offers is meaningless to the extent that you need to formulate a, a much broader range of, take a, a much more detailed strategy overall. The metaverse is probably just one of the channels is what I'm really saying, right? People go to the city centers in like New York and Paris and they go shop in the windows and then they go online and order it there, right? Okay. So then the metaverse kind of lives in between those two experiences. And, and what does that look like for each of everyone part of it? Correct. Correct. Right. We don't have chief retail store officer. 
or chief IRL officer, right? And yes. I think what I'm saying is just, <laughs> I recommend just cautiousness with using a trend or technology evolution. And obviously I'm very bullish on the emergence mm -hmm. of the metaverse. It's not that I'm not, I'm obviously, I'm very bullish. There's a podcast that I'm running on that and I'm building a company in the space. I just think that it is way more complex than meets the eye. And I think what I recommend brands and companies is to be really focused on the substance and what it actually means, what you're trying to accomplish, what is the right mm -hmm. process and strategy for your company. And as you rightfully said, it's not that the metaverse is going to be the only thing that matter, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a key channel for brands where they build and interact and engage and monetize communities and fans, which is what they've always done, right? It doesn't matter if it's Nike or a beauty brand, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So as we conclude, what's the one thing you'd like the, the listeners to take away from the conversation today? So I wear two hats, right? I wear an academic hat and I guess the hat of an advisor, investor, entrepreneur. And so I see with that second hat, I see the potential. And so often I get sort of totally inundated with the opportunity and they're like, oh, the amazing thing that's right around the corner. But then there's also sort of skepticism that comes from seeing how cyclical some of these conversations are. The, you know, the suggestion with the metaverse, quite literally in the term, is that it sort of breaks that cyclicality, like that it's not just a continuation of, oh, we have better processors and better computers, and so now we can build higher fidelity online spaces, and that's going to be cool. It's like, can we shape this new space with some different principles? Yes or no, right? And I come back to this analysis that I did early on. So there is the Roundhill Metaverse ETF, which identifies like, 45 companies or so. And it's a fair list of companies that are all pioneering the metaverse as a space. All but two of those are run by men. And so when you ask the question, who owns or who's the, who are the architects of the metaverse? Like, okay, is that, should that be a more inclusive group of people perhaps? And how do we, in this fully elastic synthetic space where we could talk about cool experiences, but also who's participating here and what does identity mean in that space? I think there's a whole bunch of squishy bits that need to be answered for a generation that cares about this, that if we take a one-to-one -one blueprint and carbon copy of what the internet currently is, this monolithic person with a bunch of big owners, with a bunch of big landlords, then maybe that's not really what's going to be successful. Maybe we need to take a moment and think about like, how can we do it slightly differently this time? What can we add to this cycle of technological transition that we haven't seen before? And how does that gel with what consumers want, what people care about and so on? And I think that's a question I constantly struggle with myself because I don't really have the best answers to it at the same time. I think a necessary question to ask. Great way to wrap up with a thought provoking question. Juice was really great. Thanks for being on the show today. Oh, really enjoyed pleasure. the conversation. Thanks, John. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Into the Metaverse. We hope you learned a lot and explored new aspects of the metaverse. 